Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast, where we turn medicine on its head, flip it upside down, shake it all about, and see what comes out. We're going to challenge convention and change medicine for the better. Welcome to Flipping Health with Grant Schofield and George Henderson and today we're joined by Cliff Harvey. Cliff, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm, I'm Cliff and I'm a, uh, I guess a researcher more latterly, but before that a clinical nutritionist, um, have been a strength coach throughout my, my career as well. Um, so yeah, basically a clinical nutritionist in practice. Uh, I began working with low carb and keto diets back in around 98, so a good 21 years ago. I uh, tried my first keto diet a few years before that as an athlete. Um, so I probably spent a little bit more time on feet with, with low carb and keto than a lot of others. Um, but certainly wasn't the first, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. How did you even get started? What provoked you to do this? Because this was not wildly popular in 1998. Yeah, no, I, I've been thinking about that because typically the, the whole genesis story of that was the sort of AUT story, which I'll talk about. But um, outside of that, I actually learned about keto a few years before I studied uh, at AUT first time around. And I was reading an old Iron Man magazine, which is a bodybuilding magazine, and there was an article in it about the keto diet. And they said, well, you know, if you're wanting to lean up a little bit, you can do this particular diet. If you keep your carbs low enough, you can still have a beer at night. So I thought that sounds good. I was looking to lean up as an athlete. I'd been putting on weight before that uh, for footy. And so I tried this keto diet and got some pretty good results. Then a couple of years later, uh, studying at AUT first time around, studying fitness training, we were doing our, our nutrition papers and a lot of the, the the prescription ideas we had didn't really seem to make sense because this we, is still the food pyramid more or less exactly because we were told that you know you had to prescribe x amount of carbohydrate and that was done first and then you basically allocated fat and protein after that based on what was left and to my mind even then it didn't make sense because we had all this emerging research particularly around protein intake and when you allocated that protein intake and you allocated even a minimum amount of fat to preserve hormonal status and reduce risk of overtraining, overreaching, there wasn't actually enough left to give the carbs. So that sort of flipped things on its head for me and I started thinking more about you know, what I came to call this carb appropriate idea where you allocate protein and fat first and then what's left becomes the, the carb intake for the person. And how did you reconcile this with what the general practice was and then you were getting into practicing doing this because uh, and I'm ashamed to admit this, but we would look across at you and go, ooh, that's weird. Was there a lot of that going on? Oh yeah, I mean, I was um, asking very inconvenient questions myself and a few other people in the class, and so we were called into the Dean, and I know this is a story I've told a few times now, but he said, look, you've done enough to pass the course, but, but don't come back, it's a little bit embarrassing <laughs> um, to have you asking these questions of the lecturers and not have them being able to answer them. And it wasn't certainly that I, it, it wasn't that I knew a lot, it's just that I was very interested about what was going on and it didn't make sense. And then being kicked out was probably the best thing because the following year I could go away and, and properly get into practice and start to apply this stuff. I didn't feel that I had the constraints because I'd already been sort of ostracized to some degree anyway. So it was just a matter of working with, with clients and figure out, figuring out what worked best for them. And within those first couple of years, you know, I was working with members of the New Zealand Rugby League team and um, you know, professional rugby players and all sorts, but also people with severe metabolic disorder, people who were, you know, 200 kilos plus. And really for those people, they've been bounced around so many practitioners getting no results. The only thing that really worked for them back then was, was keto and low carb. And they got phenomenal results. So is there some sort of irony to all this now when you see the, the rise of keto and low carb and the popularity of it and the, you know, really the, the top search term and Google for health is keto. What do you make of all that 21 years later? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing because obviously it is massive and it, it's kind of nice to see that, that it's growing. I think there are those still a lot of people who, who think this is just some ridiculous fad and it's going to come and go or you know, all the other things that I'm sure we'll talk about, the fact that people think it's dangerous and whatnot. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who, who now um, you know, say I'm not keto enough because I've got a carb appropriate 
approach to this thing. So it's interesting because um, no matter how much things change, you can still be pushed out by, by people when they have their own little little tribes. Yeah, so if you, and people out there want to do an exercise of this, to search ketosis Wikipedia and look at Wikipedia's entry on ketosis and you'll be flabbergasted, at least this week's version of it, that keto causes blindness. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up and George told me about it, he already knew about that one. Yeah. It's a two, Are you serious? This yeah. Is yeah, absolutely. Two guys, <laughs> two guys on a, an Australian aircraft carrier in late 60s, early 70s, not sure exactly, um, thought they'd go on an Atkins diet using the available food on the aircraft carrier. They were, um, because they were pilots, they were tested vision for vision and they found a visual impairment that meant they couldn't fly, couldn't land jets on the, on the aircraft carrier anymore and um, it was treatable with thiamine. Now, this is, um, there's a few things here, there are other things that cause thiamine deficiency. For example, tea, they may have been drinking more tea. There was a, they were in Asian waters, there's a bacteria in Asia that causes thiamine deficiency that's fairly prevalent in the, in the population. So, and these results have never been seen before or since, you know. It's yeah. a, and in fact, the fat sparing effect, the thiamine sparing effect of fat is an old feature of early basic research papers because you don't need thiamine to metabolise fat as much as you do to metabolise carbohydrates. On deployment, you'd wonder if the food was sufficient of thiamine anyway. Yeah, you probably boiled but meat. You're probably talking about boiled, yeah, yeah boiled water soluble meat, vitamins going to break yes. down in the refined foods. Yeah, and yes. Anyway, the great irony of that reference in the Wikipedia entry is that when you actually go and search for any actual clinical trials, there is one showing that a ketogenic diet is beneficial for, for blindness induced by optic nerve atrophy, which is the class they were talking about, and glaucoma. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the, the great thing. So I think you're right, there's still a lot of, of agendas out there, but we've certainly seen this, this science move forward. So you've started studying this more seriously as well, because I, I just got the email going, when are you available for Cliff Harvey's final PhD examination? You want to tell us about that, Jenny? Yeah, so I mean, that was a really interesting thing for me because I came back from Canada, I was up there practicing for a few years and I came back and um, our, our buddy Joe McQuillan said that you know there's this stuff happening up at AUT where they're starting to look at lower carb nutrition, uh, which I thought was super interesting and um, so I went up and, and chatted with you guys and I had I think at the time started down the master's track but in mind body healthcare which was you know is another passion of mine. Um, but obviously getting into that space, it was really the first time that I'd seen an opportunity to, to go on and do post-grad where I could actually do something that I wanted to, you know, rather than falling into line with the, um, the dietary dogma. So went on and did um, a master's in basically ketogenesis, keto flu, um, keto induction, and then moved on to the, um, the doctoral thesis, which was geared a little bit more towards uh, diet individuality, so you know, that, that sort of carb appropriate approach and, and how we individualise diet to um, a particular person, but obviously translated through that as well, a little bit of the ketogenesis and um, keto flu stuff. So tell us about that idea of carb appropriate, what do you mean by that? So basically it's the idea that um, th there's a spectrum of carb intake that's appropriate for different people. And some people might benefit most from a very low carb diet and others might um, benefit from moderate. Some people benefit from a high carb diet. And so the idea is, well, how, how do we actually differentiate that, that out? Um, so really it's, it's looking at individualizing diet. Now, the, the reason that I chose carb appropriate, because some people have asked this, you know, why didn't you call it a protein appropriate diet or a fat appropriate diet? The reality is I think there is, as a baseline, less variability between people for say their protein intake mm -hmm. because carbs are non-essential nutrient right so it stands to reason that something that's conditionally essential for certain types of performance is going to have a much bigger swing range than say protein or fat and so what are you seeing in the results of the work you've done so far what we're certainly seeing is that um we don't have strong data yet but the the indication is uh, what we'd expect that the, the worse off someone is health wise um, at baseline the probably the more likely they'll benefit from a greater carb restriction and so by health wise you said that these metabolic syndrome type parameters yeah and, and going even simplifying down from a lot of the existing research looks at obviously insulin 
homeostasis or what their level of insulin resistance is and there's some good indication that that's a really good predictor of whether someone should be on a lower carb or maybe a slightly more moderated carb diet um, but obviously we looked at just your standard blood blood measures the stuff you can get from your doctor and I think that's important because it provides a really easy measure that people can can get done simply and in a cost-effective manner that can tell them a little bit more about perhaps what they should be on. So basically the worst those cardiometabolic measures like uh, your blood lipids, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, HbA1c, that average blood glucose, um, triglycerides, you know, that they can uh, help to tell us whether someone should be on a, a low, very low or maybe more moderated carb diet. So George, what do you make of that? Yeah, that makes sense to me because, you know, if you look at old um, biomarker data showing benefits of low triglycerides, these people weren't on keto diets. There are some people who can have low triglycerides on high carb diets. And, um, and, and so, you know, if, if carbs aren't pushing up your triglycerides or, or your HbA1c, then, you know, you're, you're, you're carb tolerant. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly less, you know, less need for you to change than than for someone who has high triglycerides, low well, HDL, rising HbA1c. Yeah, and that, that's one thing that I, you know, I wrote in the book uh, about this idea is that you should probably change as little as you need to to get the optimum results. You know, I don't see the point if you're eating a really high carb diet and you can shift your blood markers appreciably and get all the results you want to by just eliminating added sugar. Just do that. Yeah. You know, that's the simplest approach. I always like to take the simplest approach to anything, really. Well, that's true, except for let's talk about your life because you've got a whole bunch of occupations mixed up as one person a, a, a practitioner, a PhD level researcher, a author, a sort of serial entrepreneur, if I could describe you as that. Uh, an educator through holistic performance nutrition. How have you ended up with so many different jobs and how do you make sense of them all together? That's a really good question because it is hard to make sense of them at times and I really need to to fragment them, well not fragment them, I need to sort of consolidate them is the better word into certain things right mm -hmm. and so I, I just see myself mainly as, as an educator in whatever sense that is whether that means giving talks or um, you know helping to educate through now you know research and scientific literature or, or lay writing or um, working with someone directly it's all basically in that space of, of education now I like a lot of different stuff, you know, I like, I get into these crazy ideas, you know, when I was a kid it was dinosaurs and then it was something else and then it was bonsai, you know, shit that I still do, but I get really obsessed about it, I think that's part of my, my mental state is to get really obsessed about something, so it stands to reason there's going to be a few things that I've been obsessed with over the years and I just can't help myself but to get into them, really. And so with that, you do, you, you've had some polar, bipolar over the years that, that sometimes you'll be going crazy and you'll be sending me emails about your master's thesis at 3.30 in the morning yeah. um, and then maybe a couple of weeks later you might be doing a little less work. Can you tell, are you happy to tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I, I sort of suffered periodically with pretty bad depression even as a kid and then through my high school years and eventually ended up that I, I left high school. Um, so I'm a high school dropout as well as getting kicked out of class at university. And then eventually doing a fantastic uh, PhD thesis, isn't that the irony? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think that's probably the, the case for a lot of people when they're non-conformists. But um, yeah, so basically had a, a bit of a history of that and then it was more laterally diagnosed as bipolar because I had these... Um, I was highly functional and I would still manage to succeed in certain things despite at times being extremely depressed, you know, to the point of you know having suicidal ideations and all sorts of things and so at times it could be very serious but it, at those exact times I could also still get up on stage and give a talk or you know have these periods where I would flip out of that and be hyper productive and so really part of the challenge has been to learn how to conserve my energy and, and be really aware of when I'm hypomanic which is that state of being really obsessed and, and highly attentive to things and control that a little bit and that's really caused a lot of the, the benefits on the other side because I think I'm not getting as, as burnt out and exhausted as I once did. So how do you as a child and a young teenager deal with that? Oh well you, you, the way I dealt with it was to, um, 
to drink heavily, take a lot of drugs, and um, get kicked out of high school. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's called self-medicating. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. and, and, and I think when, when you like that, you, you, know, the, you see the depression is the problem to treat, not the mania. The mania is like, oh, you, you know, you, you've beaten it, you know. Well, actually, while we're on the topic, because yeah. George, you've had a bit of that as well, haven't you? With, yeah, with yeah. A few things, that, and and I think your mania, and I think you're probably uh, not quite as productive, probably as as Cliff's describing, but but would over promise. Yeah, yeah. Um, for for me, what Cliff says is like very familiar. Is this thing of like, you know, like feeling very depressed, you know, quite when I was quite young, and but also getting very enthusiastic about things and he said dinosaurs for me it was the Loch Ness monster <laughs> um, for example and um and this turning into you know self-medicating the depression and kind of being high enthusiastic convincing and kind of um um you, you know um, and which is, is can be good for a creative person. When I was making music, so you know, you you obviously you're going to write songs in that framework, but um, it does mean that you can commit to something that you can't back up. You know, it's yeah. because it's not that energy isn't always going to be there. It's only going to be there for usually three or four days. I think is kind of like the, the way it would go. And um, and it also means you know you you embarrass yourself. You you know get you know you kind of over overextend yourself in the public space and. Um, Give you more reason to self-medicate yourself later, and but when I changed my diet and uh, you know I started supplementing, I stopped self-medicating so much. I changed my diet and I got to I got to a place where everything's level and everything's you know very level, and um, I can't you know I'd, I'd like to regain some of that energy <laughs> sometimes you know, and uh, it's um yeah it's it's um so so Cliff, is there a dietary component to that? Yeah, I think so. And, um, you know, we, we can obviously talk about some of the mechanics of that, but I think as well, something that George said r rings true is that, and this plays into diet, is I think the, almost the behavioural aspects of diet are really important as well. Because, you know, diet's something we have to do several times a day, every single day. And that's why I think people often struggle with it, because it's not like, even exercise, you can get really good results from maybe training twice a week, right? but you can't get really good results from eating well twice a week. Yeah. And so I think in terms of learning consistency of habit, getting into nutrition and being consistent with nutrition was a really big part of that rather than just getting that energy that you have from maybe your hypomania, going balls to the wall for a couple of days, then crashing, you know, it basically taught to, to almost live within yourself a little bit so that you had the energy to then be consistent and I think one thing that backed that up for me as well was doing the weightlifting training uh, with you know Nigel Avery and um, Richard Dryden and those guys, really great coaches, because they, they taught the value of um, basically being progressive in terms of what you're doing, not always just going in and smashing it, um, but also having the consistency that if you didn't feel that great, you're still gonna get in and do the work. Right. So I think that stuff was really important. But yeah, I mean, there are obviously um, a lot of aspects of our nutrient sufficiency that I think are really key for mental health. Um, obviously there's all the micronutrient sufficiency, we need that as the cofactors for everything that happens within the body. So there I'm talking about making sure you get sufficient vitamins, minerals, you know, your essential fats, particularly omega-3s. But also I think something that's under-recognized is just being adequately fueled. Because we have this idea nowadays in the modern world, our, our, probably our biggest health challenge, or one of our biggest health challenges, is that people are getting bigger yeah. and they're getting you know, more metabolic syndrome and things like that. But there's also a significant amount of people, even though they're a minority, who consistently under-eat, despite the fact that their weight's not changing. And they're those people that are suffering from that relative energy deficiency. And, and uh, undernourished as well, in a micro sense and a macro sense. Absolutely. And so they, they always are gonna feel underdone. And I, I mean, I noticed that particularly. That's why my biggest challenge is not to, um, you know, to, to eat in a, in a style to lose weight. It's to make sure I'm eating enough yeah, consistently. Yeah. I mean, I need to gain weight. I need to gain weight. When I went low carb, I gained the, the weight I needed, and I've kept it on ever since. So it's not the case that if you cut the carb, you're just going to waste away enough and gradually. It's, yeah. It can be a way to kind of um, normalise low weight. In my case, it was probably because of just better digestion. Just I think was the fact. It's, it's so much 
to unpack there, but one thing that I saw this morning, I don't know if you've seen it, it's in preprint now, there was a study came out where uh, they had cyclists who were training a lot taking ketone esters over, I think it was a three week period, and they were trying to overtrain these athletes. Mm. So they had basically a ketone ester versus a control, which was an MCT control, and they found that the ketone ester kind of protected them from overtraining. One of the interesting findings for me though was that the athletes taking the ketone ester actually started eating more as their training load went up and as they needed to compensate. So we often think about ketones in the blood as being a very satiating thing and it helps people to auto-regulate down. But maybe it's got an effect that's differential and it helps people to auto-regulate anyway. Yeah, or it just creates more normal homeostasis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that kind of makes sense if you have higher levels of ketones, there probably is a signaling role there that, hey, maybe you are undernourished or underfueled, yeah. yeah. because obviously that's when in a natural sense we would be producing more ketones, and so the drive might be there to eat, eat more because of that. Yeah, yeah I've, I mean, I've often, often wondered about the whole metabolic advantage argument. Why would it be an advantage to lose energy? Wouldn't that just make you more hungry, just like exercising or any other... Um, any other thing, and um, and that perhaps helps to answer it. Is, is ketones are a signal in any given context? They're kind of a signal to to move towards a healthy homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So so just thinking about the health system, and actually, yeah, we'll talk about mental health and the full health system. But what, what's what's going well in that system? What works, and then what what doesn't work? I think we're pretty lucky in New Zealand because we have. A, I still think we have a pretty good safety net. You know, if you break a leg or you have, you know, any sort of major problem, we still have funded health care and I think a lot of what we have is really good. I think sometimes it's a little bit broken because, um, you know, that the fallback is always to treat the problem and not necessarily to provide better societal stuff that helps us to, you know, avoid the problem. Um, I saw that quite clearly when I had a, a pretty bad episode with the depression and um, my doc said, look, your, your scores are, are so bad that we can't um, put you in for funded counselling, we can only put you in for drugs. Because huh. you've got to get to a point where you're actually a little bit better in order to qualify for counselling, right? Huh. So from my point of view, that, that seems a little bit distorted because obviously we would want to have support for people who are most at risk. Yeah. Now, thankfully, I could, um, because I had a business and things like that, I could afford to go and get good psychological care, but a lot of people can't afford that. And I think that's probably our biggest issue is we've got a lot of people at the, the you know, bottom end who are basically falling through that net and are not getting the good advice or support they need. I think that particularly comes through in our um, dietary guidelines. You know, and I don't necessarily think it's just that they're wrong, they are, but I think it's also that they're too complicated. I think we need to simplify our health messaging down a lot. And what would that sound like? Well, I, th I think it's taking the focus back to, hey, eat, you know, we put together those real food guidelines, yep. obviously all of us, um, get back to seeing food in, in more of a, almost a, a philosophical way rather than a, a quantitative way, because we can't expect people out there to be food scientists but they can understand, well, natural food, you know, eat more natural, unrefined food, eat it with friends, eat foods that are your traditional foods. You know, these things have pretty good outcomes, and we see it time and time again in research that when people are uh, educated on that, they do well. You know, look at the, uh, the work that was, was it O'Day, did all that work with um, Australian Aboriginals? Getting them back eating traditional Aboriginal foods, it was empowering but it was also the best thing for their health for their health and physiology. Yeah, because no one actually cares about micro and macronutrients. Yeah, if, if, you're being, if you're being told to eat 30% of your calories of no more as fat and less than 10% of your calories are saturated fat, how many people can work out what that is, really? The only way you're going to know is if somebody tells you this product will help you achieve that. Exactly. You know, and that's um, just opens, you know, just throws everyone to the walls, you know. And, yeah. And even though the word, you know, a word like natural is actually very hard to define, it's still very easy to understand. You know, what is natural? Because nothing's really well, yeah, natural. And, yeah, no, that's right. And, and, yeah, but you tell people eat natural food and they kind of, they get it. You know, it's stuff that doesn't come in a packet. It looks like it did on the tree or on the ground or in the animal. Yeah, it was recently like growing or running around in nature or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the, the analogy I always use with my clients is I just say, close your eyes and imagine walking through a forest. What do you see? 
You see leaves and berries and nuts and seeds and animals. Well, eat, eat them. Great, you're done. <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> so, thinking about Cliff Harvey's day, week, month, yeah, what do you do? What's, what are your top three things that you concentrate on for, for your own health and well-being? Three things. I think the, the number one, which uh, might surprise you a little bit, is um, a mindfulness practice. I think that, that that's critical. And that's something that I have, um, I guess in some way, been involved with for 37 odd years. You know, when I was a kid, uh, my, my old man was into yoga. And so I just started mimicking what he was doing. And then um, my mum and dad bought me books on uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and all sorts of things, just because they knew I was curious. So I got into that pretty early, and I think that's been a, a real foundation for everything else. And so, how does how does practice of that? So, do you get up in the morning? Do you do something? Do you set aside time? At the moment, I'm actually not meditating in the morning, so I'm a bit of a hypocrite. But uh, typically, the yeah, that that would be the thing. Is I wake up in the morning and uh, do at least a, even if it's just a five or ten minute mindfulness of breath. So it's just a mindfulness of breath meditation where you're sitting in silence and just noticing the breath in and out. So really simple stuff. And, and how you're dealing with the thoughts that come in? Yeah, well just letting the thoughts be really. And whenever you get carried away with those thoughts, just to return your, your attention very gently to the breath. And that point, um, the, the, you know, the signal I use, which is pretty common, is just to look at that um, or to observe that point on the nose where you can feel the breath exiting and entering the, the nose. Basically just do that for five or ten minutes and I think the, the key for a lot of people is just to be consistent, not to try and necessarily increase the duration within a sitting to something that's excessive because that starts to freak people out. So when I get clients doing that I often say, well do you have a minute tomorrow? Like, yeah I've got a minute, I can do a minute, easy. <laughs> okay we'll do a minute tomorrow and then add a minute until you get to ten minutes. So each day add a minute. So you do two minutes, three minutes, four minutes until you get to doing ten minutes and then try and sustain that for at least 30 days. By the time people do that, I typically find they've got a, a practice of meditation. Because so you, you're not trying to somehow self-transcend and, and it's not like that, is it? No, I think you know people do, and I, I'm sure I did when I was a kid. I wanted to be enlightened and you know walk around on a on a cloud and everyone would think I was awesome, and then I realized that was just bullshit because it was my ego getting in the way. And more so, I just figured that, well, I mean, at the end of the day, I think I was always a scientist, right? I was reading books and looking at, at evidence for things. And we know the evidence is there, it improves your life. So that's going to happen, just do it. So I guess that's the point now, is I still meditate every day. I don't necessarily do it in the morning, but meditate every day and that's the foundation. Um, outside of that, for me, consistency of eating is, is really important. So making sure I have uh, three meals a day just because I'm one of those people who tends to under eat. So if I have that consistency of eating, and I, I work mainly for myself and with a lot of my clients, if they don't need further quantification of what's in a meal, in other words, they don't need strict portion control, I just work on really easy structures. You know, two palm size servings of a protein food, three fist size servings of veggies, add oils to it, you're done. That's easy. Yep. Um, and then outside of that, uh, sleep, is critically important, so as I make sure that I get to bed by about 9 p.m. every night. Yeah, it's, I, I've just actually finished reading a book by a, a California neuroscientist called Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. I mm. absolutely recommend that as is massively enlightening to anyone who's interested in the, in the scientific aspects of why we sleep and any of the practical aspects and how to do something about it. But he's pretty awesome. I tell you what, you just totally I regard it as a societal underestimation of its benefit for our health and well-being for such a long time yep. you know sleep but also the you know the various things that both cause lack of sleep and spring from it you know overall stress and fatigue and all these types of things we don't pay attention to it because I think it's inconvenient to do that you know it's probably why we don't pay attention to a lot of things in health because it's inconvenient to actually look at how our society is set up and how every structure we have is set up because we want to be driving people to work more and more and more. We want them to be productive, right? And we have to realise at some point it's not going to work. And there's a great irony in, in missing sleep because of exactly what it does for productivity. Yeah. Well, you look at work hours. You know, it's, it's pretty well known now based on the research that if you continue to work longer and longer hours, you think 
even if you're tired, you're gonna be more productive. You're not, and you're not even less productive per hour, you're less productive overall. <laughs> Isn't that an irony? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, what to do about that? Because I've been reading this stuff and I've been talking a lot about randoms to, about sleep, and I, I would say it's running at about 50% of people going, oh, I, you know, I've got a real problem with sleep. And, I, and then a, a couple of people at ATP, they go, oh yeah, I don't, haven't really slept more than three hours a night for the last 10 years. It's just like, it's yeah. just like, oh my goodness. And I think it's easy for people to think, well, I do pretty well, so obviously I need less sleep. But what I'd often hazard is that they would feel markedly better if they did sleep. Yeah. yeah. And how do, you, how do you do that though when it's so systemic? I think that's where we need very simple guidelines. And that's why, you know, with, with my clients, for example, I'll have a, often a very short prescription. It's little things like, okay, we have a morning routine, which involves you get up, you have two glasses of water, and then you do some meditation. Then we have that simple meal structure idea that I talked about, which takes care of the day, and then some simple sleep hygiene techniques at night. Without overcomplicating it, you know, we sort of talk about things like, well, turn off your screens by 7 p.m., use a blue light blocking app on your phone, get to bed by 9 p.m., um, you know, maybe read some fiction at night, because fiction's the best sleeping pill you can get. Or read one of my books, that'll put you to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like listening to music um, if, I, if I'm going to sleep. I find Robert Schumann, um, uh, chamber music uh, is very soporific. It's just right on the right borderline between boring and interesting, if you like, but boring in a good way, a kind of an ambient way. Yeah. Um, you know, it still rewards listening, but it does kind of lower you in. Um, yeah, yeah, I find music very helpful. That's really interesting from a lifetime rock and roller that is listening to classical music. Yeah, it's a kind of a logical progression. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very stereotypical of you. Uh, well, I'm just, you know, just saying. Um, actually, just one of the, I just read a really great book, which is um, Shane Carter's new autobiography, Dead People I Have Known, and he makes that progression too. Um, and but it's a it's a fantastic book. I really recommend that. Excellent. Okay, Cliff. So what? You're sounding quite guru-like there. What doesn't go well there on the health? What could do better? I think that the biggest thing for me is when things start to go downhill. Um, you know, obviously, I I start to be less consistent with those things I I know I should be doing. Right, and the, the first thing that starts to go for me is, is food. And it doesn't mean that I eat poorly necessarily, I just stop eating. And then I end up getting more and more burnt out and that pretty much just drives fatigue, which helps drive depression and all that kind of stuff. So it becomes a downward cycle. At that point, that's when I find myself just choosing you know, junk food because it's easy. And so I think one of the things, I actually talked about this on a radio show a couple of years ago, People were calling in and asking, well, when I feel really bad, you know, people with bipolar disorder it was, when I feel really down, what should I do to feel better? I said, well, that, that's a good question, but maybe we should be thinking more about what we can do consistently to build the habits of behavior so that when you start on that downward slide, you bounce out quicker, more quickly. Um, so for me, really being having that focus on, on consistency of eating is so critically important. It's something I think I've only really realized the last couple of years um, because I think through a lot of my life, particularly my 20s, I was practically starving, but I felt like I was in great shape because I was. I was ripped to shreds and I was lifting really heavy weights and everyone thought I was awesome, but I was actually you know, starving. To undernourished. Sleep, undernourished, not sleeping because I didn't have any food in my body. You know, getting these little twitches and muscle ticks from magnesium deficiency and being stressed to the max and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. yeah.